Good evening and welcome to Fungi Map members, visitors across Australia and overseas. Firstly, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land upon which we meet today. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I also recognise their scientific knowledge of fungi and its use in Australia. My name is Susie Webster and I thank you all for joining this Fungi Maps inaugural lecture series. Um, at any time during this event, please feel free to submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your window and our hosts, myself and Sophie Green, will raise these with our speaker to answer during a brief interval in the middle and then again at the end. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Tom May, Principal Research Scientist at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Victoria, specialising in macrofungi, and he is also the co-founder of Fungi Map with John Julian. Tom's topic today is Fungi Map, putting Australian fungi on the map across three decades. I will let Tom introduce you to Fungi Map and its purpose. So without any further ado, welcome Dr. Tom May, take it away. Thank you very much, Susie. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, and that should be sharing now. So hopefully uh, you can see um, the screen there. Um, so today um, I'm going to be talking about Fungi Map and I'm going to split it up into two bits. The first will be about how Fungi Map got started and kind of what the point was. And then we'll have a brief uh, intermission in the middle for questions. And then the second part is what do we do with all of the data that's been collected over the years? So in this first part, I'm going to talk about the antecedents of Fungi Map and a little bit about order from chaos, targets, the evolution of Fungi Map uh, and the Fungi Map community. So going right back to the antecedents, I was thinking about kind of my background and, and what was it that kind of led to the idea of Fungi Map. And one of the important things was that I grew up in suburban Melbourne in Blackburn and the house that I lived in right here was just down the road from some remnant bushland in Blackburn. And as a boy, I spent a lot of time uh, paddling around in there, catching butterflies and looking at birds and probably the odd fungus even, trying to key out grasses and so on. So I was really fortunate to spend a lot of time in the bush. My parents were, we, we camp out at places like Wiperfield over the holidays and so on. So I spent a lot of time uh, in nature uh, uh, and was always keen to kind of identify things. And I had a great year in, uh, in the mid seventies. My dad worked in Scotland for a year. And when he arrived at the university there, he said to the secretary, is it something that a young lad could be occupied with? And it being a zoology department, they said, well, there's this bumblebee mapping atlas. So I got really engrossed in that. And this was a scheme in the UK to record bumblebees. And the UK has had a long history of recording schemes and there were maps and there were, everything was gridded out into these little grid cells and you caught the bumblebees and sent them off to someone in Cambridge and they came back with little notes on what they were. And I got a great thrill from compiling records and sending them in and particularly to filling in gaps in the distribution. So there were grid cells in the north of Scotland where we would go for holidays, which hadn't been, no bumblebees had been recorded. So there was this thrill of both learning about all the different bumblebees, which were really neat to identify because they had basically these different coloured stripes and whether it was a red stripe or a yellow stripe and so on, they were relatively easy to, to identify. Uh, coupled with this sort of thrill of um, filling in gaps in the, in the distribution. Uh, and I think that sort of was in the back of my mind for, for a couple of decades brewing away there. So in the, in the 1980s, I, I got involved in fungi. Um, I, I was studying um, a PhD in fungi at Monash University and I got involved with the Field Naturalist Club um, and picking up on a tradition that really goes right back to the start of the club in the 1880s, there were annual fungal forays and I was invited to lead some of them. And uh, really following on from the tradition, I guess people like Jim Willis 
used to publish lists of the fungi that were found in the Victorian naturalists. So based on a few of the forays around the 1980s, I started doing that. Here's one of the forays with uh, Ilma Dunn, one of the um, botany group members of the field nats. Um, and in that first report, I said that it's hoped that these lists will add to an understanding of the distribution and ecology of the species and also serve to highlight the incomplete knowledge of many groups. So I kind of knew there was probably something useful about publishing these lists, uh, but they just sort of sat there in the background for a while. Uh, and once I started working at the uh, Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria in the, in the early 90s, I was sort of thinking about research questions and I kind of realised there was a very low knowledge base for distribution and particularly when looking at maps. So I went into the herbarium and was thinking, my senior interrupter, beautiful pixies parasol, very distinctive fungus. Uh, we would usually see it on the forays and, and so on, easy to identify. And there were only two specimens in the herbarium at that stage. Um, so I thought, well, there's not much to go on. And then I looked in the literature and that was the scattered things like the foray list. And for each one of those, I had to find the list. Then I had to work out where the locality was, work out the latitude, longitude, plot it on a map. And even after that, there was a few more records up here in the Central Highlands and the Otways and down at Wilson's Prom, but it still didn't kind of quite look like a proper distribution map. I wasn't sure. So that was the kind of genesis of fungi map, was realising that there was a low base of information and a lot of potential to, to add information. Now, the order out of chaos thing came from, I think anyone who's engaged with fungi, the first thing that happens once you get into it is you get overwhelmed. There's all this new terminology to learn. It's a whole new kingdom with lots of different structures and stuff. That's really exciting, but it, there's still a lot to learn. And the other thing is there are a lot of different species. The taxonomy is very chaotic. We don't know a lot of the species. We don't know how to tell some of them apart. So at, on our forays, we lay all the, the specimens out. And I kind of realised, well, look, you could get really overwhelmed with that and, and, and spend ages trying to key something out. But in the end, and on any table that we had, there might only be a couple of things that we could really know well. So on this table here, here's a Cortinarius, what we used to call Demosophy splendida, now Cortinarius persplendidus. And that's a really distinctive species and it kind of stood out and we could get to know it. So I kind of flipped things around and instead of trying to sort of deal with the everything and the fact there'd be a hundred species every time we went out, most of which we couldn't name, that idea of focusing in on the known and working out from that, I think is very important in kind of managing the, um, the, the diversity of fungi and, and the chaos around it. And the other thing was kind of coming up with the idea of target species for, for survey. This picks up some of the early surveys that kicked off in the UK uh, several decades before, but the idea that you wouldn't try and survey for everything, but focus in on target species. So these are things that are readily recognisable in the field. They stand out because of their bright colours, their unusual form. And in devising a list, I think I started off with, with eight species and then we gradually added to that over the years. I was thinking, well, I kind of be good to have something from around Australia so everyone could get involved from different habitats like rainforest and desert and also trying to be representative of the different morpho groups like puffballs, mushrooms, stinghorns and so on, and the different major genera. And I think a key thing was that I realised that if we made a list of all the really rare things, well, no one would find them and it wouldn't be much fun. So a key thing was that most of those target species were widespread and common. But a couple were deliberately put in there because they were rare and it would be good to get more records. Some of them didn't have formal names and where there were several species and we weren't really sure of the taxonomy, the, the term group was used. So among those early target species were things like Mycena interrupter. It's bright blue, there is nothing else like that that grows on wood. Uh, Azero rubra, the wonderful anemone stinkhorn, again, really distinctive and the smell as well. Is, is something intriguing. Uh, in terms of different habitats, the Coquina tricholoma from the tropics, the Podaxis pistillaris from the deserts, the different morpha groups, things like Pseudohydnum gelatinosum, like a cat's tongue with the spines, um, 
And as far as rare species, this Gloeophyllum concentricum, which at that stage was only known from a couple of collections across Northern Australia. So a whole mix of different species. Another way of looking at it back then in, in terms of trying to make sense of things was that at the same time I was compiling a catalogue of all the species of fungi described from Australia and I was doing this initially on, car, on a card index in collaboration with Alec Wood, uh, University of New South Wales and I'd list all the different records under all the different names and there was a, a metre or so of these cards. But a lot of those names I couldn't really connect in anything real or it was all confused. So this, these were the records of Lepiota gracilenta, which we now know is what we were calling then, it's actually Macrolepiota clelandii. Uh, but there was a lot of names where no one had seen it for a hundred years and so on. So out of that big list, picking out particular things, so here's a whole list of Amanitas, and most of those Amanitas at the time, probably only the person who'd actually collected and described it would have recognised it, and there wasn't really any information on how to tell them apart in the field. But this green one, well, that's really distinctive. Now, there were two green ones, so we just lumped them together as a group, and that taxonomy of those two, which is Ostroviridus and Chlorophylla, still hasn't been sorted out, but meanwhile, we can get on with mapping it, and eventually, if there's two species or one, well, we can worry about that down the track. But it was really about taking these very long lists of names, most of which I'd never seen, I didn't know how to tell apart, and picking out things that you could engage with. So back in 95, I wrote a little document. It was back in the early days of computers and so on, and I, was, I loved fiddling around with drawing these pictures on the computer. So I wrote a document about uh, a mapping scheme for Australian fungi. And I'm very fortunately at the same time, John Julian uh, was a, a very active member of the Field Naturalist Club of Victoria um, and was looking for things that the club could do actively. He set up a fungal survey at Wattle Park, a very early survey of an urban bushland. And John was really great at organizing things. So immediately um, the club agreed to kind of get going with a pilot scheme. John created a newsletter, got a mailing list, uh, got publicity going. And we were just gonna run this for a year and see what happens. Um, we got a lot of interest from people sending records. And after a couple of years, by 1998, 2000 records have been submitted. So at that point, we just thought, well, we'll just keep running it. It really seems like a good idea. Um, and we expanded the target species list from kind of the, the eight uh, pilots through to 50 and eventually to, hun uh, to 100 and we're still adding um, species even today. Now two key things that happened back then, we're now about 2000, was that Ian Bell, the late Ian Bell, uh, created a fabulous CD-ROM, very cutting edge technology back then, as an aid to identifying um, the fungi map target species. And then in 2005, Pat and Ed Gray, um, with a lot of input, input from Leon Kostermans, produced this marvellous fungi down under field guide to the 100 target species. So not only did we have a list of target species, but we had really good guides to assist people in identifying them. And both of those things also acted as really good ways for people to engage with fungi because they covered a broad range of different sort of Morpho groups of fungi and, uh, and like you know the puffballs and the stinkhorns and bracket fungi and so on. So I think that was a key part of it as well. That there was something to assist people in identifying these readily recognisable species. And then um, coming uh, sort of a, a bit later in the two thousands, a key thing. So initially we were keeping all the records in spreadsheets and eventually we moved to a database, but we didn't really have a way of putting that information out and we tried to build our own website, but luckily along came the Atlas of Living Australia. So this offers unprecedented access to point distribution data. Uh, it was coupled with a, a large amount of effort to database herbarium and fungarium specimens, getting the geocodes, the lat loads onto them, the lat longs onto them. Uh, and through Australia's virtual herbarium, more than a quarter of a million records of fungi uh, are now present in the ALA from, herb, from fungi area around Australia. And look, I'm deliberately using the word fungi area to mean fungal collections, even though I know my own institution is called the National Herbarium of Victoria, but as far as I'm concerned, within that, there is a fungi area. Uh, and then the fungi map records were uh, chuffing along now. We've 
well over 100,000 records, mainly of the target species. So putting them together, the Atlas of Living Australia offered a single portal for all of that um, information from about 2010. Uh, and that's really been a world leading uh, portal for access to biodiversity information. Um, and it globally, there's the Global um, Biodiversity uh, Information Facility, GBIF, and all the ALA data goes up to that. But within Australia, we've got this really nice window into our biodiversity data. And now there are more than half a million records of fungi in the ALA. That includes lichenized fungi as well as non lichenized fungi like mushrooms. And this map just shows the density of records. So the red grids are where there's more than 500 individual records from that grid. So it's still fairly patchy right across Australia, uh, but that's a lot of information. Uh, and compared to where we were several decades ago, there's been a real kind of turbocharging of information about fungi. You can see over time, this is the number of records in the ALA over time. So this includes all of the historical uh, fungarium specimens. And you can see specimen wise, there's a relatively no, low number of specimens collected over the years. That's partly because a lot of the early specimens are held in overseas fungaria, which are not yet digitized. Uh, so there's probably more collecting back here that's not showing up, but there's a bit of a rise in collecting around the 60s and 70s, mainly of lichens. Uh, and then we get the observational records coming in with fungi map in the 1990s and a lot more observations now than specimens. Specimens have dropped off in the last decade. We're not quite sure if that's real or there's a, just a lag in accessioning and databasing specimens. Uh, and even now, just within the first year or two of the 2020s, there's a lot more observations coming through. So all of this information is now available through the ALA. And what we're now seeing is distributions like this. So here, the fungi map records are the blue dots. And unfortunately, it doesn't contrast very well. I'm sorry about that. But the red dots are the fungarium uh, specimens sitting on top of the fungi map data. So if we drill in a little bit and look at Victoria, you can see how the fungi map records really fill in. So I, I often talk about the fungarium records being like the skeleton of a distribution. They give you the broad uh, overview of where something is. And then the observational data fills in the flesh around it and really gives you the detail. So we're seeing a lot of distributions of fungi map targets that have a lot of detail in them. And when we think back to what we had in the mid nineties with just a couple of dots on the map, uh, there's been an increase in the number of fungarium specimens, but particularly this observational data is really filling in uh, a, a lot of the distributions. And what we're seeing is that if we look at the fungi map target species, um, so in these frequency distributions, here's the number of records across here, and this is in a, um, a power scale where there's one record, two, four, eight, sixteen, all the way up to 2048. And this is the number of species along here that have that number of records. So for the fungi map uh, set of 100, this is the analysis of 100, there are quite a few species that have in the hundreds to two hundreds to thousands of records and very few of the fungi map target species don't have many records. But if we contrast that to a set of fungarium specimens, there are hundreds of species sitting in fungary with only one or two or four records. So the bulk of the species of fungi that sit in fungary, we hardly have any specimens of. And then there's a few that have 30s, 60s, 100s and 250s and so on. This isn't for all the fungi and it's not including the lichens, but it's just a contrast to show that we've been quite successful with fungi map for getting a lot of data uh, and we're way ahead by sort of several orders of magnitude in terms of comparisons against most of the number of fungarium specimens. Because if you think about it, you can go out in a day and record lots of observations, but collecting is much more intense and requires a lot more resources and so on. So it's you know, to add another 100,000 specimens into Fungaria is, is, would, would, would have not really been possible without a huge increase in resourcing. So sort of behind the scenes, that data from the mid 90s was coming into the herbarium. Originally, Pat Gray um, was helping to put it in spreadsheets. Um, Jenny Tonkin helped convert that to a database and then we, we're able to maintain that in database. And then once the ALA came along, we we're able to send the data up to the ALA. 
but in effect, all the records were coming into the, the Fungi Map office. And then behind the scenes, volunteers like Wendy Cook and Graham Patterson here were doing a lot of manual processing of the records. Sometimes people just sent in a locality and without the detail of the latitude, longitude, and that had to be worked out from maps and so on. So the model until the last five years was all the data came into the office, was popped into the database, and then from 2010 or so that data was going up to the ALA. And there was a lot of behind the scenes checking of records, where there are photographs, most of the photos were checked as, as they came in. Um, and then in the last four or five years, we've moved to iNaturalist as the portal. So the portal being the place where people can put the records into. So before people would send photos, records and so on, spreadsheets to FungiMap office. Now anyone can just jump on iNaturalist enter their photos. So now all of the records have photos associated with them. And, and then there's a community out there who's active in assisting to identify those uh, images that come in. And we can see a real shift um, with the iNaturalist records here in the uh, magenta and the, or the sort of darkish browny colour and then the sort of pinkish purple being the number of records that are coming into the FungiMap database. We're still accepting records into the FungiMap database, but at a very low level. And we really encourage people to use iNaturalist because it is just a much more efficient way. And also iNaturalist then pushes the records straight to the ALA uh, every couple of weeks. So it's a much quicker process. So that's been a fairly sort of successful move over. One of the reasons we delayed that a little bit was that we've moved now, instead of just recording target species, really with iNaturalist, people just record whatever they like. I still feel that the concept of target species is useful as far as books and teaching, but if people want to record, take photos of fungi, you, you, you can't really say only upload photos of the target species, it's everything now. But a lot of the photos on iNaturalist are not identified. Little brown Cortinarius's, pale grey Mycenas and so on, they will just sit there as Mycena and Cortinarius. But, but that's okay, one day maybe someone will be able to identify them. But a lot of the target species, they will, they will get checked and identified fairly rapidly. So parallel to uh, the recording, I think if we sort of think of the question as what is fungi map, because mapping is in the title, often people think of fungi map as just being an organisation that's looking at mapping of fungi. But actually fungi map is much more than that because when we started to do the mapping, uh, immediately a community grew. So I had experiences such as back in the late 90s, we were attending um, conferences and meetings like the Australian uh, Network for Plant Conservation. And here, um, Pat Jordan, uh, a fungi map recorder uh, from uh, the south coast of New South Wales, is here with myself and Ed and Pat Gray. And Pat had brought her, uh, Pat Jordan had brought her um, photo album of photos of fungi and she'd never had anyone to show that to before to chat about what are all these different fungi. And so I realised that there were people out there who were really fascinated with fungi and that fungi map was also a way of connecting up people. And so we started to run workshops and conferences and so on. And we had a lot of fun over the years with that, with both specific workshops, um, specialised expeditions. Here's Graham Patterson and myself in the Tarkine one year. And also uh, the, the conferences that ran every couple of years. So to me, FungiMap's been both the mapping scheme, but also now in a, a very uh, a, a national NGO for fungi, which uh, involves uh, both increasing knowledge and information, but also advocacy, networking, and so on. And I think as we've reinvented the mapping with the shift from the behind the scenes database through to using iNaturalist, so we're kind of needing to reinvent the way we link up and communicate. And I mean, it's such a thrill today to be talking to people through this, this the Zoom kind of thing that we're all getting used to because we did have the national conferences, which was a great way of meeting face to face, but just logistically it became really difficult. So now I think we have new opportunities to communicate, run workshops, give seminars and so on, and to kind of continue to reinvigorate Fungi Map, particularly around the people side of it. I think the mapping ticks over quite nicely behind the scenes, but it's also really exciting to think of these new ways of connecting up. So I'm going to stop for a few minutes now in case there's any questions.
And then in the second part, I'm going to talk about what on earth does it all mean? Oh, thank you so much, Tom. Um, so, yeah, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Sophie. Um, I'm the coordinator of FungiMap. Um, so I do a lot of the behind the scenes admin kind of stuff. So I've probably, you know, communicated with a lot of you at um, some point or other. Um, yeah, thank you. Tom, for the, the first part of your talk, um, I love seeing the, you know, image of you as a little boy and just hearing about your, your journey and how you sort of got in, came to have your love of fungi. Um, and it was also great just to see, yeah, how Fungi Map has evolved and sort of the huge labour of love that it has been for you and lots of volunteers and lots of people who've um, contributed, you know, specimens and um, reported species around the country. So on to questions, we have two questions. We have about 40, 40, a few more than 40 people listening, um, which is great. So hopefully some of those people have more questions in the second half. Um, but the first question is, do you include lichen and mosses in a um, fungi map recording? That's a good question about the lichen. So mosses, no, because mosses are plants. So the bryophytes, the mosses and the liverworts and so on are, are green plants. Uh, lichens, however, are fungi. They're just a particular type of fungus that's growing in association with either a cyanobacterium or green alga. We would like to include more fungi, and it, and there are a couple of um, uh, more lichens, and there are a couple of lichens that were added as targets uh, about a decade ago. Um, but what we found was it was quite difficult to find ones that fitted as target species. So. It, it's an interesting contrast. Mushrooms, very diverse, many new species, not well known, a lot of work to do. But the larger lichens are actually quite well known. There are, there are handbooks to them. There are specialists who, who do a lot of work on the taxonomy. But uh, a lot of them just look like greenish kind of crusts or, or whatever. And we've engaged with lichenologists and tried to come up with some different target species. But really, we've only been able to come up with a couple like the... Uh, Xanthopalmilius semiviridus, the one that all uh, rolls up into a ball and then comes out again when it, when it wets up and it rolls around in the desert areas or the drier areas. And the Thamnolia, which is like little icicles sticking up in the alpine regions. So lichens are fungi, so they're within the kind of the, the province of fungi map. But in terms of mapping, we, we haven't been so successful in finding species that are easy to, to map, but they're definitely within the fungal kingdom. All right, thank you for that. Um, got a couple of good questions from Tash. She says, I love that you refer to the internal fun fungal records at the herbarium as the fungarium. Do you think we will ever see an independent, uh, from Flora, funded, dedicated physical space for fungi, an Australian fungarium? <laughs> yes, I, I wish, I hope. Um, I think the, the nature of the way Australia is set up because of the states, the Commonwealth, the CSIRO, the different agriculture agencies, I think it's always going to be difficult to set up a, a like a national fungal institute. It's always going to have to be something networked and connected. But I, but I do think that just as at Royal Botanic Gardens Q, they call the fungal collection a fungarium. It just it sits within the organisation. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, there's, there's a national fungarium there within Landcare Research. So I think it's just a matter of using this terminology, and I'll, I'll come to, back to that in a minute, actually, even if physically we sit inside other institutions. And I think actually, resource-wise, I'd probably prefer to sit organisationally within the botanic gardens, but have fungi recognised. And certainly at RBG Victoria, we're, we're very strong on mycology. We've got a... a Teresa Labelle uh, moved over to Adelaide recently, which is fantastic to have another mycologist at the at the South Australian Herbarium, and we've recruited a, another mycologist to come into Melbourne. So we're really supporting mycology from within the institution. So I, I'm, I think I just need to paint a sign, fungarium, and nail it on the door <laughs> within the institution, even even though the building's called the National Herbarium. All right, thank you. I might come back to Tasha's other question later. Because um, we have another question, um, does Tom have a favourite genus to work with? Yes, um, well, well, two really. Um, so the, the uh, Lacaria uh, is a genus that I did my PhD on. Little, 
kind of flesh colored to uh, kind of orangey brown mushrooms. Extremely difficult to tell apart, but probably several dozen species in Australia. And I'm still trying to work out how to tell them all apart. And one day I hope to kind of finish that work. Uh, so I've, I've got a very, very soft spot for Lacaria. And I also like Cortinarias because I see it as the eucalyptus of the fungus world in Australia. Very diverse, lots of species all across the country, growing symbiotically with, with eucalyptus. Um, and that's a slightly different issue of, of sheer numbers and diversity there to sort out. But um, they're, they're, they're the favourites among many, many fungi that I kind of like. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, I might just do one last question um, before the next section and then we can do some more questions again at the end. Um, we've got a question about Indigenous people's relationships with fungi throughout the time and whether much is known about this. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great question. Um, and it's something I've thought about a lot. And from the perspective of the kind of Western science and Western history, we can see that there, there was certainly some knowledge there, but that's from the perspective of kind of early European explorers asking Indigenous people questions. And so it's framed around what they might have thought to ask. Um, so I think there's a lot there to explore still. And I think that we can see, for example, in the central desert, there are uh, Pichinjara and Walpri people who eat underground truffle-like fungi that only appear at certain times of the year when little cracks in the soil are there. So we know that Indigenous people have a very close relationship to the environment and would know intimately the different plants, animals and fungi of an area. But I think that uh, in terms of what information is compiled and so on, in, in terms of, for example, language and, and different species that might be used. There's not really much there, but I think there are opportunities to kind of um, collaborate, um, to d discuss and so on, to bring that out. Um, it's often a question that's brought up with in terms of edibility, uh, but in terms of what's recorded there, there are very few species that, that are recorded um, as edible. Um, but it's not quite clear whether that's just because, I mean, for example, you could say that the, many of the early explorers were English. England, the English have a fear of fungi, generally don't tend to eat it, them nearly as much as continental Europeans. Maybe if the French had been exploring, they might've been more interested in what fungi were eaten and asked more questions. So we have to sort of think through that. And also it seems um, from, the, the little research I've done is that w women would have been very important in, uh, in, in the knowledge about fungi. And again, most of the early explorers were, 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 you know, they were men, they were not thinking to ask the questions of the right kinds of people. So I think that's, a, that's an area where it'd be great to have a lot more discussions and collaboration ar around that kind of knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like I've read a lot more about medicinal, Aboriginal medicinal uses of fungi than I have about um, the edibility side of things. So um, yeah, it would, it would definitely be a great area of more research. Um, so thanks for all those questions. Um, we'll try to answer the rest of the questions at the end. Um, but if anything doesn't get answered tonight, um, we can always um, include them in a follow up email, um, some, of the, some of the replies. So yeah, all right, back, back to you, Tom. Right, so I'll just um, get back onto the right screen. Well, that was just a picture of the, the, the inaugural conference, um, just sort of the point at which we kind of realised there were actually a lot of people out there with an interest in fungi and it was great to get them together. So in this second part, I want to look at like, what does it all mean? What's the point of all these dots on the maps? And I'll look at policy, I'll look at questions and answers in, in the sense of scientific questions and answers. I'll uh, look at conservation and then a little bit about the future. So distribution maps, I think are actually very important in conceptualizing species and making them real. Uh, and there's a long history back to the kind of, at least the 1950s and somewhat earlier for bird books to include distribution maps. Here's a, here's a map from a, a bird book from the US in the 1950s. Here's a, a page from Kosterman's um, book on the um, trees and shrubs of Southeastern Australia that came out in the early 80s. 
very detailed maps of all the different eucalypts. We're very familiar with seeing maps in guides to all sorts of different biota. And I think before there were maps of fungi, it kind of meant the fungi weren't really real to people. They said, well, you don't really know what a species of fungus is and you don't know anything about them, so why should we bother? But the maps uh, kind of make them real. So with Fungi Down Under, all of a sudden, by, by the point that was published, there was enough data to produce quite decent looking maps. And I think those maps were critical in making the species real, as well as all the other information in there. Uh, because those maps kind of look like the maps of real species. We know eucalypts or birds or reptiles that have those kind of distributions. So from a policy point of view and a strategic point of view, I think the maps have been important. And there's a big move now, um, as was alluded before by one of the questioners, about recognising fungi. They're a separate kingdom of the natural world. Uh, they're very diverse, they're quite different to plants. And so there's a push now to use this three Fs language, flora, fauna and fungi, uh, even to go for flora, fauna and fungi. So specifically that's the plants, animals and fungi of a particular area. Uh, so this was a paper published a couple of years ago. And I think we'll be seeing this terminology coming through a lot more. And the maps are good because they're saying all these things are real. And so that means for things like policy, for example, this is the State of the Environment Report for 2016. Now, previous State of the Environment reports didn't include anything on fungi, but here we have a page on fungi with a map, and this was provided by Fungi Map on request of the, the people putting the State of the Environment together. So here we have information about fungi, questions about them, and so on, and, it, and the maps make them look real. And we've moved from a point where people say, well, we don't really know anything. And again, it's this kind of order from chaos kind of thing. Instead of focusing on everything we don't know, if you push through and say, well, we do know this now, and even with our limited resources, we've managed to get this far, and this is all the other things we'd like to be able to do. So from a policy advocacy point of view, I think maps are very important in making things real. We can also see this um, Taxonomy Australia, which is the kind of... Uh, overall group for um, taxonomists in Australia. Uh, they, there's a strategic plan there, Discovering Biodiversity, that came out a few years ago. And fungi are definitely recognised as a separate kingdom, a mega diverse, a big task to describe them all. And for example, here on their website, they've got the new Australian species from 2019. And we can see here that you know 117 new species of plants, but almost same order of magnitude, 77 new species of fungi. So fungi are definitely not now tucked under plants. They're out there. We've got flora, fauna, and fungi. And this is very important from an advocacy policy strategy point of view in furthering our knowledge and understanding of fungi. Now, in terms of the distributions, from a scientific point of view, I suppose the first thing that dots do is just give us a distribution. They show us where something is. So this is Omphalotus neoformis, the ghost fungus, one of the fungi map target species. Here's the map today. So we see a shape to that. And immediately for a scientist, the questions become, well, what's going on there? Why is it like that? Why is it not here? Why is it there? So just for each species, we can start to look in, what are the factors controlling the distribution? we can start to overlay different individual factors. So this is the distribution of Omphalotus in the Atlas of Living Australia, plotted over a layer of precipitation. It's counterintuitive because the, green, the, the dark blue is actually the driest bit and the orange is the wettest bit. Uh, and so we can see here that the mushroom is found through these areas of high rainfall in both southwest and southeastern Australia. Uh, absent from the very high rainfall areas of Western Tasmania. And as one goes further north, uh, it almost looks like you need more rain because the temperature rises as you go north, so the evaporation is higher. So there'll be an interplay of different factors. No one factor will explain everything. But there's a fairly close relationship between the rainfall there. And if we carry out uh, bioclimatic modelling, so we take the points where a fungus is on a map, and we look at a number of climate variables like annual precipitation, annual mean temperature, um, evaporation, seasonality, and so on. 
and we use modeling and in this case we've used the Maxent uh, by environmental niche model and if we take the places where a fungus is and say they're all between you know 80 and 150 millimeters of rain or what it might be ever it might be and if we do that over a number of variables and we let, then we look for all the other places that fall within that climatic envelope uh, we can take this data here the blue means on the basis of the current spots there's not much chance they're going to be there because it's very different climate the green to red means the climate's quite good so there's not a lot of red in there but there's quite a lot of green that overlaps quite well with the current distribution so if you take the current distribution it's saying well pretty much everywhere that has that climate we found that fungus including up here in the wet tropics. A few little spots here where it might be, where it hasn't been found, a lot of gaps to fill. So we can start to see that overall, there are discrete, broad distribution patterns for Australian fungi. Many of them have very broad distributions, a bit more like birds than plants. A lot of plants are only found in one mountain range or in one catchment. Fungi have got, on the whole, very wide distributions. The modelling suggests that climate is a strong driver of distribution. You'd also have to take into account host for fungi that have a, either a parasitic or a mycorrhizal relationship, but even their climate is important. And it seems like the simplest explanation is the spores blow around and the fungi are dispersing out to the climate limits subject to habitat availability. Uh, that analysis was carried out by a summer student, Grant Harris at the Botanic Gardens. Uh, another question that we might have, there's a lot of interplay I find. Once you see a map, you can kind of look at it and go, what's going on here? So the next question you have, if we look at that map there, that outlier there for omphalitis is a long way from the rest of the distribution. So the one of the questions would be, is it actually the same species? That's a long way north there. So just over this summer, Russell Lark at the Gardens um, has been doing some work to see if we can confirm wide distributions with DNA sequences. So in this case, this is Hebeloma aminophyllum, the ghoul the ghoul fungus, the one that grows with skeletons. And here we have the yellow dots are the DNA sequences overlaid on the blue dots are observations. The fungarium data is the uh, red dots. And so here, this southern distribution is confirmed by the yellow of the DNA. We've actually got quite a nice spread of DNA sequences for that species from the work of Betty Rees. And those sequences were all analysed um, previously and shown to be the same species. But here we have specimens from the wet tropics and from around southeast Queensland which haven't been sequenced. So immediately the question becomes, well, are they actually the same species or not, especially this one up here? So there's a constant interplay as distribution data comes in, you ask questions, refine things and so on. So I think it's really exciting to have the maps because before we had the maps, you couldn't conceptualise these kinds of questions. So there's really a lot of ongoing work uh, to do to interrogate these maps, continually refine the information. Um, and as we do that, we learn more about the different species. Now, when you've got uh, say fungi down under and in looking at fungi down under and, and seeing all the different maps in it immediately you see that a lot of the distributions are quite similar there's a lot of things that are found across southern Australia there's a few things that are found only in the deserts uh, there's a couple of things that are um, only up in the wet tropics and so we have sets of species that have similar distributions so most species have very wide distributions and if we block out Australia into a series of jigsaws, uh, pieces, if you like, most of the species fit into either one or a number of these jigsaws. So the desert ones, Padaxis pistillaris, Batarea phylloides, Schizostoma laceratum, are all within this envelope, more or less. Uh, there are species that are found everywhere except for the deserts. There are species that are found across the top end, like Gloeophyllum concentricum and through to Queensland. Species found right around here, in the top end down the east coast to sort of northern New South Wales. Species found not up in the top end, but along the east coast further down south. And then this very common pattern here in southeast and southwest uh, Western Australia. And so there's these, seems to be these discrete regions 
and different bits of those jigsaw make up the broad um, distributions and many of the species span different regions and really there's very little evidence so far of fungi that have quite uh, small distributions within these bits of the jigsaw. Now it could be that they're the rare ones we haven't found yet um, so we have to keep an open mind but on the whole most of the fungi have these wide distributions. So then the question would become how do we work out the boundaries to these? So uh, Grant uh, produced these boundaries just uh, manually by kind of trying to fit it against the maps. But if we uh, carry out what's called bioregionalization, there are analytical ways of determining those boundaries. So this is very early work and thanks to August Howe at University of Melbourne for um, getting me on the track with this. And August will be, um, he's doing a PhD in this, in this area of modeling and fungal distribution, and he'll do a lot more sophisticated analyses over the next year or so. But just briefly to explain the concept, here we take each grid and we look at all the different species in, that are in that grid, and we cluster together grid cells that have a similar suite of species in them. And this is just a very early analysis uh, for Victoria, just for Agaricales, which are the mushrooms and relatives. And we can see there are a couple of clusters in here, but particularly this green cluster and then everything else. And that green cluster maps back into this area up in the top corner here. So just blowing that up. Uh, and the, uh, all of the blank cells don't have enough information. So even though we have a lot of data, there's a lot of cells where people haven't um, gone looking yet. So we see that there seems to be a boundary up around here between a set of species that are different to a set of species down here. And in effect, that's that transition up into the semi-arid area. We are starting to get things like Padaxis, Bataraya, Fellerinia and so on. And uh, down here is just the, the big suite of all the common different mushrooms. And there's a lot of refining to do with this. And one of the things that we're gonna need, particularly uh, in areas like North Queensland, the Northern Territory, the Northern New South, Northern Western Australia is a lot more data. So even though you think your record of a very common species from a grid cell, it might be the 2000th record of a species that is well known. Once you get to these kind of analyses, we would only have a 10th to a hundredth of the data that would be available if you were looking at eucalypts or acacias or birds. So there's still a need for just bread and butter day-to-day -day recording, even of common species, but particularly in grid cells away from capital cities. So this uh, bioregionalization has got the potential to grid out Australia, look at where these boundaries are, uh, and start to understand then the evolution of these different species. Are the species in this desert interior semi-arid group, did they all evolve from each other or did they evolve from relatives that are out in this more temperate bioregion? So there's a lot more uh, investigation that can happen. And this is what science is about. Question, answer, question, answer. And the wonderful thing about fungi is we're not gonna run out of questions. Uh, and I think that's one of the really interesting things about fungi is that there's just so much to learn. And as we learn, we ask questions and then we go back and look uh, to do more analyses. Now, in terms of climate change, that was uh, uh, one of the um, um, uh, things that we were thinking about in the 1990s to do with fungi map. Uh, the idea that it was, it was a good idea to record where things were in order to start to predict what the effects of climate change were. Now, in a strategic point of view, I think we've kind of moved a long way beyond that, but in some ways we haven't. Scientists back then were demonstrating that climate change had the capacity to have significant effects on different species, and fungi are no exception. But now really the challenge is we know that, but it's what, what do we do about it? We haven't therefore worried too much about modeling much with the fungi, uh, but that fungi map data collected back in the 90s and the 2000s and so on, so on climate change was starting to bite in then that is the, it at least is a baseline against which we can track things. And there may be species that are particularly susceptible that we're gonna to need to keep an eye on. So we don't have any analyses for Australia yet, but this is just an example for Tricholoma matsutake in China. So this is a well-known edible species for which there's a lot of information. And this is the current distribution here with a model saying there's very good areas for that species based on the known distribution down here in South 
uh, China, but also up in here in the Jilin region. So those are the two areas where it occurs and on the current kind of modelling, they're good for it. Now, if we make a climate change scenario for 2070 under a particular climate change scenario, these areas are much less suitable. This one up here is moved from having quite a bit of suitable to highly suitable to pretty much marginal. And there's a, in here, there's no really very few highly suitable areas so climate change will affect fungi just as it affects other organisms. And it is something that we're going to need to keep an eye on. But without that early data, we wouldn't even really know if species were shifting around. And again, that's a good reason for recording every year. So that if things start to disappear, we, we, would, we would know about it. So even common species, continually recording all the time is a really good idea. Now, the other sorts of things we can do with fungi is we can get drilling into individual species, their relationships with their partners. So this is a large species of Lucaria that I'm embarrassed to say is still known as species A, but one day I will get around to formally naming that, but a very distinctive species, um, quite distinctive both on the morphology and the DNA. And here there's enough distribution data to map the fungus, the yellow, over the host. It's an obligate symbiont of Notophagus cunninghamii. And you can see that that's confirmed by the fact that every single dot of that fungus is within the area of distribution of Notophagus cunninghamii. And it pretty much spans a fairly wide amount of that distribution. In fact, if you calculate the kind of area that the fungus occurs, it's in about 80% of that total area occupied by the host. So probably the areas it's lacking is just, we haven't got around to looking in there. So that's really interesting that it, it doesn't have to be totally within the whole area of the host. It, you know, it might only occupy the wetter or the drier bits, but it's actually pretty much co-incident. And it would be very interesting to do this kind of analysis on much more widely distributed species to see how they might be limited by the host and which bits of the host they occur in. In this species also, uh, Elizabeth Sheedy carried out some really nice work on the population genetics, because that's another question you have is these widespread distributions, if you've got something in Western Australia and Victoria, how are they held together and they're not speciating and separating over time? And Elizabeth looked at the population genetics using markers, uh, microsatellite markers, and she found that there were distinct signatures within the species that showed there was a separation of the Victorian populations from the Tasmanian ones, but they were still enough migration. You only need a spore or two every generation to be blowing across Bass Strait to hold the species together so it doesn't speciate off into two distinct species. So uh, there was both some local structure, but also enough migration. So those species that are found in the wet tropics all the way to southwest Western Australia, there must be spores blowing around, otherwise they would would speciate over time. So either they're very recently forming that distribution, but if they've been there for a while, there has to be migration. And the really cool thing would be to try and find that through things like spore traps and find those spores blowing over. So technically that's possible. So again, the distributions prompt questions that then you apply analyses and further questions kind of pop up. Uh, in terms of conservation, the IUCN Red List has a, has a very defined way of assess, assessing threat status. Um, there are lots of species assessed globally. Um, lots of them are mammals, birds, sharks, etc. But a lot of fungi are now starting to creep in there. There's several hundred fungi now assessed globally. And that requires a very um, defined set of information, which includes the extent of occurrence of a species. Um, and things like the number of populations. So distribution information is critical in making conservation assessments. And a number of species have been assessed for Australia, including Hypocreopsis amplectans, assist as critically endangered uh, at a global scale. And the data for that, uh, this is actually a, a rare exception for fungi. It has a very restricted distribution and that in itself is contributing to its rarity but so are the threats. Here is one of the um, known populations. This is actually the type population. And we see here sand mining, definitely a threat to that. There's the fungus occurs right there and in here. So there has been a contraction in the habitat of that fungus over the last couple of decades. Um, 
but it was the uh, fact that we could calibrate the rarity of that species against the widespread species that meant that previously, if you said, oh, look, we only, we only know it from a couple of sites, the question would immediately be, have you looked? Well, now we can say we have, because all those fungi map target species have been sitting there for a decade or more, and the common ones, we have thousands of records. And even though hypochrapsis is a little bit nondescript, it's still distinctive enough that if it was out there more widespread, we would have found it. So again, uh, recording common species helps calibrate uh, rarity, and we use that information in these conservation assessments. Here are a number of other species that have been recently assessed globally uh, as either endangered or vulnerable. Some of these, like Fisher's egg, Claustula fisheri, and this uh, weird little ear pick fungus, the Aeroscalpium from Blackwood, they would be mappable. Other things are probably a little bit more difficult to identify in the field, like this Antraloides atrocerosea. Probably it's a little brown shoe leather, leather as Pam Catsicide likes to call it, and probably there you'd need a bit of experience to be identifying that in the field. Uh, so not everything is going to be suitable for widespread mapping, but there are enough species in there that are distinctive uh, that good information could come out of further mapping. So really, I would encourage people to keep collecting. There are lots of gaps. So even for Omphalitis nidiformis, Australia-wide, the distribution has that look of, well, we know it pretty solidly. But as you drill in, here's Brisbane down to Sydney, there are a lot of gaps. And so even though at this scale it's showing is occurring right up the east coast to the southeast Queensland, here there are gaps. And then you drill in around Lismore, there's a lot of gaps. I think most of those gaps are just lack of people on the ground in those areas. Uh, but we don't know until people have looked. Um, and then this is the iNaturalist project, and that's really what we encourage people to engage with and pop their records in through. So I'll finish off there, but I'm really looking forward to um, answering a few more questions. Great, thanks, Tom. We have a lot of questions um, in a few different groups. So just uh, because we're talking about people um, contributing to the iNaturalist project, um, we had a question about whether it's be more useful for people to focus on the specific species that you listed, like the target species, or just keep uploading any old thing that might one day contribute to data um, in the future. I I, I look at iNaturalists as kind of like the ocean. You know, there's stuff floating on the top. They're the target species that we can see. And there's all that stuff that just drops down to the bottom of the ocean. So of all the records in iNaturalist, you know, a, a certain percentage at the moment, it, it's, it's, it's quite high. It's just not identifiable. And it's kind of bycatch, but I don't think it matters anymore. The key thing is take a really good photograph. Get close, take several photos, top, bottom, under, side, whatever make uh, records of where it's growing. And if those photos are really good, someday someone may well be able to identify it. And that might actually be some sort of form of artificial intelligence analysing the exact colour of it in a way that we might not be able to perceive. So I think that's the critical thing. And, and also that means doing a little bit less so when you go out, don't worry, you know, there's, there's always more fungi than we can cope with. Every time we go out, there's more than we can cope with. So if there are 100 species on your walk around the bush in the day, get 10 really good photos with good information and log that in. Don't worry about snapping everything quickly and take, you know, because there's a tendency to kind of try and want to snap everything. Realise that some of the fungi you see will be old, mouldy, immature or whatever, and not worth photographing. So I'd say good recording, it, it really doesn't matter what it is, if you know it or you don't, but make that a quality record. Great, thank you. And that, that helps answer one of the other questions that we had. Um, we've also got a couple of people have um, asked questions about absence data and whether that could help with the climate change modeling, um, like yes. whether there could be categories for that a species is not found um, and how, yeah, how we could possibly integrate that. Yeah, look, the excellent question. Um, and I actually had that on the hypocryopsis. The red there is actually the absences. So absence data is very important for, for rare and threatened species. And in fact, one of the populations of hypocryopsis seems to have gone extinct. So with that, iNaturalist, uh, I'm not quite sure how you would do that in iNaturalist, but if you've gone to the effort of, of looking for species in particular and you haven't found them, there's a special bio-collect project um, on, on the ALA to do with rare fungi map targets. 
uh, and we might in, in due course push some of that out through the, the e-news and that's a way of putting your negative records in and, and that's very important to trap that. So yes, that would be ideal to, if, 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 you, if you know something and you're regularly not finding it, and it's a, particularly if it's a rare species, that, that would be quite useful. Mm. All right. Um, I guess it does make it hard though, if you know, all we can see is the fruiting body, the sporing body. So, and that only happens when the conditions are right. So it's a, yeah, it's a bit of a challenging well, thing to do. One of the things with biocollectors, they actually ask you for the effort. So I know with Hypocryopsis, I've crawled around little swamps in Gippsland looking for it. And I'll say like two hours, habitat look really good. I've uploaded a photo of the habitat. So there, there is capacity to put a, a lot more information in. But, but I, I still think for the rare ones that if you stack up quite a few negative records, that it's very useful for the modelling. It, it actually gives a lot of more power because all the modelling we're doing so far is only on the presences and the, the absences for, 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 it gives a lot more power for modelling. Sure. Uh, another question. Will you be looking to sequencing to identify mushrooms in the future, not to take away from traditional methods? Um, I assume that's a yes. But did you want to talk about sequencing at all? Yeah, so basically, as far as the taxonomy is concerned, it's all sequencing. Um, we, there are so many cryptic species, the morphology is so fluid. Uh, it's not to say that we don't take into account the whole thing. It's morphology, it's growth in culture, whatever we can get at. But sequencing is a huge part of it. And probably we'll be moving more towards like total sequencing of all fungarium specimens. Would, would, would be conceivable within the next five or 10 years. So in terms of day-to-day -day identification in the fungarium, if someone sends a specimen in to me, we're almost at the point where it's quicker for me to get that sequenced, well, not necessarily quicker, but it's cheaper for me to get that sequenced and work it out that way. But that depends on having the full set of all known species sequenced. So heavily, the science is moving towards sequencing, but that's the thing about the fungi map targets. These are things that you can identify in the field without needing to sequence it. I suspect for Lacaria that some of the species will not be identifiable without sequencing, or maybe you would just have to know where they came from geographically, but you would not really use that in the first instance to separate species. So it's just part of the toolkit that we're using, um, but that's the beauty of the target species. My center interrupter, you know, within Australia, there's no question at the moment that it's one species. There's a big question as to whether the thing in New Zealand and South America is the same species, but here it's, there's no question so far that it's one. And hopefully we would confirm that distribution from the sequencing and then people can just record that. There's no need for it. I'll just pick up on another question actually, which was, do you accept specimens that are difficult to identify from a photo? I must say the specimens are absolutely super critical important, but fungi mappers always just focus on the observations apart from when we ran expeditions. And so for collecting, I think the best group to engage with is your local fungal studies group. There's active fungal studies groups in most states and regionally. They offer fantastic workshops and so on, often in collaboration with the local fungarium. And fungaria, we love specimens, but it's a, it's a different thing altogether. It's a lot of training required to make decent specimens. And so with FungiMap, we never thought that specimens were going to be viable because to get 120,000 records, we would have been totally swamped with specimens coming in. So I'd encourage people who are interested in collecting, by all means, get into it, go for it. We, we you know, well annotated, good quality collections are wonderful. Uh, but I naturalist is really about observations and the collections come in a, a, a different way. And as I said, the collections give you the bones of the distribution and the observations flesh it out. Beautiful. All right. And final question, because I know we're running over time. Uh, we've got someone asking, what exactly is a spore trap and how would it work? Well, at its simplest, you could use... Um, uh, uh, like like the way they sample pollen when they do the pollen counts, you just basically have a pump that sucks in air and a filter, and then feed the, it's feasible to take that filter paper and sequence any any DNA and any spores that were sitting on there. 
Um, another way to do it is to put cultures of fungi out of a particular species and put the so-called monokaryotic culture out, which needs another spore to land on it and grow in order to be competent to fruiting. So if you leave them out and the right spores blow on and the mushroom pops up, then you know that something's blown onto it. So there are, there are ways technically of doing it. Um, and I think it's just yeah, a matter of someone getting interested in that as a, as a, as a, as a project um, and getting some traps out there. But I, I think the hypothesis at the moment is that because those distributions are coherent from a genetic point of view, there has to be gene flow. Uh, and the simplest explanation is the spores are blowing around. Now, which direction they go is quite interesting and how often that happens. But I think that'd be a great challenge for a young mycologist is, is find that, you know, with birds, there's bird banding and so on and tracking and you can work the migration out. Um, but for fungi, it's a lot more challenging. But, but there, and this, this is the same for things that are found in different continents. It appears as though there's very low rates of things blowing around and that's enough to keep them coherent. All right, thanks, Tom, and thanks everyone for your questions. Um, if there are any that we didn't quite get through, um, we'll send in an email tomorrow or the next day, and we'll also send a copy um, of the recording of this session. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Susie now to wrap up. Isn't it great to hear that fungi are now recognised officially to be separate to flora? Hopefully, an opportunity for future funding. Thank you, Tom, for your valuable time. Sadly, we've come to the end of ours. Um, as Sophie's just suggested, um, if you've still got questions, send them to fungimapcoord at gmail.com or as Sophie said, she'll send out um, an email to all of us. <clears throat> if you would like to join Fungimap, perhaps buy books or just have a look at what we do, please go to our website, which is fungimap.org.au. Also, if you've enjoyed tonight's webinar with um, Dr. Tom May, you may uh, like to book for next month's webinar, which is Australian Bolites from, he fr sorry, from there to here with Dr. Roy Halling from the Institute of Systemic Botany, New York Botanic Garden. I've had the pleasure of training with Tom, uh, with Roy, and he's an expert in Australian Bolites. Thank you everyone and good night from Fungi Map and see you at the next lecture. So yeah. Bye. So yeah, thanks everyone.